Good afternoon to those of you in Australia, or good morning for those of you who may be calling in from elsewhere on the world. I understand we have participants calling in from over 10 different countries to attend this lecture. My name is Gordon Flake. I'm the CEO of the Perth US Asia Center, and I'm honored to welcome you today to this online public lecture uh, with Jane Halton, AOPSM. Before we begin, uh, allow me to acknowledge that it is the tradition of the Perth US Asia Centre and the University of Western Australia, at which we are located, uh, to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet, even if it's just virtually, the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Uh, Ms. Jane Halton is a member of the Australian Prime Minister's National COVID-19 Coordination Commission, and is also chair of the Global Epidemic Vaccine Body, known as the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, or CEPI. In the search for a COVID-19 vaccine, five of the world's 15 COVID-19 clinical trial programs are CEPI funded, including clinical trials now underway in Perth. Well before the evolution of COVID-19 into the global pandemic that it is today, Jane has played a very crucial role in Australia's public health management and the development of health policies. Her distinguished civil service career included senior health policy roles in Australia and abroad, including as chairman of the board of the World Health Organization and as Australia's secretary of the Department of Health. She has been awarded the Public Service Medal and is an officer of the Order of Australia. On a personal note, the closest I have ever come to being prescient or, or perhaps even prophetic was the decision my family and I made seven years ago to move from Washington, D.C. to Perth, which now probably can lay claim to being the safest city on the planet on land. Um, uh, Jane's claim to that status is far more credible than mine. Uh, a few years ago, the Perth US Asia Center in 2017 was honored to host Jane for a private uh, roundtable discussion on the health security challenges in Indo-Pacific more broadly. And you will not be surprised to know that during the course of that forum, Jane highlighted the health and economic risks of novel viruses and influenza pandemics. Her accuracy then has heightened our interest in hearing from her again in the current climate and our desire for her to share her expertise and knowledge with you more broadly, our supporters. So Jane, on behalf of the Perth US Asia Center, thank you so much for making the time. All of our speakers are busy, but few in the current climate can claim to have as much on the plate uh, as you do. Uh, thank you for making the time. We look forward to your remarks uh, and to a chance for a short conversation with you afterwards. Over to you. Thank, thank you. And um, I, like you, would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on uh, who you, you certainly you are hosting this. But for me, uh, sitting in um, southern New South Wales, I should acknowledge the traditional owners of these lands, their elders past, present and emerging. Thank you. So th thank you, Gordon. And uh, my greetings to everybody, regardless of where you are and what time of the day it is. I'm very conscious uh, that there's a mixed audience for this discussion. I'm um, having had a little bit of a look at the kinds of people who had registered and for the, the, there are, I think it would be fair to say, a span of probably background interest and knowledge uh, of people who are quite expert in relation to the specifics of what we're going through at the moment and the generalities in relation to pandemics. But then we do have, I think, a number of people registered for whom this is probably the first time in their entire life they've had to even grapple with the notion of pandemic, let alone have it influence the day-to-day -day lives. So with apologies to both those extremes, uh, what I'll try and do is strike a, a reasonable centre in terms of the way I'll frame these remarks. And on the basis that my instruction was actually explicitly not to talk for too long, because that way we can have a, a conversation. There'll be many things that I think you might uh, be interested in pursuing. And um, as has been observed, uh, this has been something that has been a feature of my life for a very long time. And I used to say that one of the reasons I worry about it is that mostly that means other people don't have to worry about it. But sadly now everyone is becoming uh, an expert on terms like flattening the curve. So uh, if I hear one more of my friends have flattening the curve trip off their tongue as if they have been doing their entire life, I, I shall feel that my entire professional career has been redundant. <laughs> uh, Gordon uh, rightly makes the point that I did speak uh, at a group, uh, to a group of people at this center um, some couple of years ago, and that was my privilege and my pleasure. Now, whilst I didn't have this experience with anybody who was in that session, I will relay a similar 
uh, indeed a related anecdote if I might to start. I have been worried about the issues around novel uh, viruses, particularly those that uh, derive from zoonotic events. We can discuss that more later. And as a consequence, have spent quite a deal of time not only thinking and working to be as prepared as we might be globally in respect of these issues, but also of trying to alert people, and this includes decision makers, uh, people who have power and influence, that we need to do everything we can to prepare. And that has included the giving of um, more than a few lectures on this subject in my time. And as this pandemic was gathering steam, I received um, what was a rather grimly amusing uh, WhatsApp for those of you who use that particular variety of messaging. And it was one of my students from the National Security College in Canberra, where I, um, for my sins, spend some time every year working with a fantastic group of young people. And this particular student had uh, taken a picture of a piece of his notes from last November. And the notes said something to the effect of, novel viruses potentially dangerous for example coronavirus important to remember pandemic histories of the past and then it's got question mark underneath and the message that came with this image said at the time i wasn't sure that i believed the risk and i certainly didn't know what coronavirus was i certainly do now mm. so <laughs> uh, to the point about prophetic uh, here we are now, what I'd like to do is start with a couple of basic observations, if I might. And for those of you who darken your day with ever reading anything written by um, people who are in the conspiracy theory category, um, you will have seen assorted remarks about uh, this is a manufactured virus. It's a function of 5G. It's no worse than flu. Uh, it is a conspiracy from Bill Gates and others. It is about global domination and control. I could go on, you get the flavor. So let me just deal with a couple of basic facts, if I might. To start with, this is not flu. Uh, let's take global deaths to date this year as something really simple. Uh, so far this year, from this uh, event that we're currently in, COVID-19, as named by the WHO, uh, but as a result of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, it has resulted in known deaths that now amount to over 700,000 globally. And there are measurement issues, which I'll come to in a minute. So far this year, people who have died from malaria, again, enumeration issues, but amount to fi about 580,000 people. And in terms of flu, this is no worse than flu, 290,000 people. So even if you take a head-to-head -head comparison of deaths, um, you can see it in the first instance, and let's remember that the rate of death from this disease is accelerating, it is not declining, and at least in part, this is because the first wave of this disease hasn't yet made its way and finished its way around the world. And in many countries, including in the Asia Pacific, uh, it is only really just getting started. The second myth to counter is it's not really that serious. So we were all no doubt aware of uh, the fact that there's particularly bad outcomes in terms of morbidity and mortality amongst older people. But I think we should not kid ourselves that the disease itself, its ecology, its longer term consequences are not known. We haven't had enough of it. We haven't seen people, uh, once they've had this disease and taken account of health issues that they develop, we do not yet know what the long-term issues are from having had uh, this disease. We do, not, do know that the uh, outcomes, particularly for older people uh, in terms of death rates are high, but it is not reasonable to say it is simply a disease that will badly affect older people. Uh, we are seeing bad outcomes in younger people, including in children, but we also do not know whether there are long-term coronary and or other issues that come from this illness. And certainly there is emerging evidence, uh, a term which may or may not be known to you. Um, I thought this was about travel when I first heard it. The notion of um, long haulers. Now, in my world, 
uh, I'm sure Gordon's the same, long haul usually refers to what we do to get to other parts of the world. And we're all quite good at it because we learn, uh, and as far as I'm concerned, an aircraft flight that lasts for under eight hours isn't long enough because I don't get settled in. But in terms of COVID-19 COVID long haulers, these are people who go through the acute phase of the illness and then they have a much longer term and recurring set of symptoms, which are uh, as a minimum debilitating and potentially uh, much more so. There's also a series of uh, pieces of research that are starting to emerge in terms of the cardiac consequences, uh, particularly in terms of cardiac inflammation, which again, we do not know the long-term uh, consequences of. So we, see, we need to understand that the actions you're seeing taken by governments around the world are as a consequence of the death rate, uh, the unknown nature of the disease, and including uh, the fact that we do not know when we are going to get treatments and or um, a vaccine. I've mentioned at the outset that I wanted just to refer you to some of the enumeration issues. It is important to understand that um, while we all look at the numbers and we say there are about 700,000 deaths at the moment, in many, many places, uh, the capacity to accurately diagnose, uh, enumerate uh, the number of people who are actually positive with this particular virus, and then even to correctly attribute mortality to this virus uh, is variable. Partly that's to do with access to testing, Partly it's to do with, in some cases, the sheer scale of the number of people who have sadly passed away. And so ultimately, uh, we may only ever know in some countries and sometimes through an analysis of excess mortality. And by that, I mean, how many people would normally have died in January, in February, in March, in April, and in each month in a particular country in a particular year? How many people actually died, assuming it can be accurately measured? What is the difference in that mortality rate? And how many do we think were due to uh, COVID-19? And how many of those uh, excess deaths, which were not explained by COVID-19, are potentially actually caused by COVID-19? So we have some way to go. In terms of testing, Testing is um, a really important part of understanding the scale and the scope of this uh, illness. And there again is variable testing around the world. So uh, in our region, Singapore, uh, the current numbers I have is that they have tested about 500, 251,000 people per million in their population. So just pause for a second. Now, this is not taking account, obviously, people have been tested two, three or four times. But that means on average, one in four of the Singapore population have been tested. You um, take that down to uh, other levels, Afghanistan, where basically only about 2,000 people have been tested out of a million in that population. So that gives you a sense of uh, the difficulty in firstly knowing how many people have got the disease, but also when it comes to mobilising a public health response, uh, it makes it very difficult to know exactly what the scale of the problem that you're confronting uh, is. So why is the current outbreak something which is some people should worry about? Well, clearly, uh, governments all around the world are very worried about this uh, disease. And why are they worried? Because it has a very direct impact on trade, on travel, on consumer confidence, and on the ability of countries, economies, and people to get on with their lives. The, the broader health risk, of course, is also notable in that regular activity, in addition to economic activity in respect of health, is being disrupted around the world. And whilst the health needs of people in low to middle income countries uh, have been uh, a challenge for many, particularly in terms of immunisation, and we've made great, great uh, strides in that respect over the last however many years. Of course, all of those things are currently being disrupted, which will have themselves additional health consequences. So around the world, we've got a variable impact uh, in terms of the spread of the disease. And again, acknowledging the numeration issues, but it's interesting to look at the number of cases per million of population around the world. In terms of good testing rates and in terms of the actual incidence of the illness, Qatar has the unfortunate um, title of having the most cases per million of population. So the million per population case rate is over 39,000. 
Singapore in our region is sitting 17th in the world at about 91,000. Sweden, which is often talked about as the alternative approach in terms of the just letting it rip strategy whilst trying to protect the particularly vulnerable, is sitting at about 8,000. In India, where cases are just starting to ramp up, it's over 1,000. In Australia, it's 762. And in New Zealand, it's 314. What this tells you is two things. Firstly, that the disease uh, is traveling at about the same speed as travel in different countries. It's spread around the world very quickly. And now its spread is only being retarded by what we would call non-pharmaceutical interventions, NPIs, everyone loves an acronym. And those are the things which I have no doubt you are very familiar. Social distancing, hand washing, hygiene and etiquette, uh, which includes the old cough or sneeze into your elbow and not into your hand. And really importantly, uh, the wearing of masks. And I should emphasize here, if I might, that the wearing of masks in Australia has been quite controversial. Um, I am in the wear a mask camp, have been very firmly from the very beginning, which has made myself look desperately unfashionable uh, while walking about. Um, I personally stopped shaking hands with people at the beginning of February when it was perfectly clear this was getting itself out of control, which ma made me appear unfriendly uh, and uh, possibly uh, distant, not understood to be socially distant in a medical context. So what is it we're now waiting for? What is it we're hoping for? And how is it we might go forward for the next little while? Firstly, uh, obviously, we want a vaccine or preferably multiple vaccines. We need treatments. We need things that will make a difference to the outcomes for people who sadly will end up in our hospitals in intensive care. And ideally, we will have improved testing because that will enable us to tell how many people have the disease, where it's spreading, which will enable us to actually structure our responses accordingly. And I know that everyone's interested particularly in vaccines, so let me give you the potted summary before I uh, open for uh, the question part of this discussion. To start with, and probably hopefully, there are uh, in excess of 250 groups around the world working on a vaccine. And that's fantastic. However, there's a very long road between a group of people working in a laboratory on a vaccine candidate and having something that can safely and effectively be put into the arms uh, or wherever of potential recipients around the world. And indeed, knowing that it is safe, it's effective, it can be manufactured, it can be delivered, and it will be targeted to those people who will get in the first instance the most benefit. So as uh, Gordon said, I chair CEPI. CEPI was set up to look at novel viruses and we actually made our first investment in coronavirus now nearly two years ago. Uh, we also made investment in what we call platform technologies. And those platform technologies uh, are things that are designed to respond rapidly to what we call disease X, the unknown disease. And it's specific intention was to be able to deploy those technologies to come up with a vaccine candidate in literally uh, 16 weeks from the point of the genetic sequence of that pathogen being available to the production of the vaccine candidate. And I can tell you that the University of Queensland candidate, which is one of nine candidates that CEPI has in its portfolio, uh, that actually comes from that rapid technology investment that we as CEPI made with the University of Queensland. As I think has been indicated, there are, in fact, there are over um, 20 uh, candidates that are currently in human trials. Um, some of those are showing promise and uh, we are hopeful. Uh, and I now say that I am cautiously optimistic, uh, whereas I was um, hopeful previously, I'm now cautiously optimistic. Uh, I've got a, a range of DEF CON responses. When I get to DEF CON 9, I'm enthusiastic. It looks like it's gonna work. And I'm sitting at the moment on about DEF CON 3 maybe three and a half. Uh, but essentially, we do need to make sure before uh, we widely deploy any vaccine that we actually are confident it will work and we are confident that it will actually be safe. We cannot afford to do people damage in this context. And as has been said, five of the, uh, uh, those number are already in human trials in the CEPI portfolio. We're anticipating others will go into trial fairly shortly. 
I should say that there is a mechanism called the COVAX mechanism, which is an initiative of CEPI, uh, GAVI, the God Alliance on Vaccines and Immunisation, and the WHO, uh, launched by the President of the European Union some time ago, uh, with now a friends group, which is chaired by Singapore and um, Switzerland, which is looking to uh, ensure that we can roll out uh, effective vaccines to the 20% of the world's population who are most vulnerable, the elderly, the immune compromised, first responders, including health workers. And that particular mechanism, we're looking for countries to come in and participate in. And I chair that mechanism with the chair of the Gavi board, Dr. Ngozi. So Gordon, I've talked probably a little longer than I intended because I, I hope that gives people a starting point, a kickoff point for the conversation. I could talk for the next hour, um, but I think that wouldn't help all of our, um, our participants perhaps get the issues they want responded to. So over to you. Well, thank you so much. And there have been a number of questions submitted in advance by people as they registered and there'll be some coming through as well. But I wanna take uh, the advantage of moderating to kind of uh, ask you some specific questions based on your experience in the policy realm. Um, yeah. Not coming here just as, as a medical doctor without understanding kind of be hum human behavior and how policies are enacted, but you referenced yourself some of the challenges around uh, sensitivity of masks in Australia. Mm. Uh, obviously, that's nothing compared to how polarized that issue has become in the United States. But yeah. taking the optimism, whether it's three or 3.5 that you've got in vaccines right now, I wonder if you might look ahead at the fundamental risk we have of rolling out a vaccine in a public policy environment where people are skeptical of masks, uh, there is a growing kind of anti-vaccination movement, uh, small in Australia compared to the US, but still kind of quite broadly in the US, Europe, and other places. I'm wondering if you, if you would talk us through the public policy measures that need to take place and for us to move to that next phase uh, where a vaccine is not just available, but can be used effectively. Yes, thank you. It's such an important question. So I chaired the COVAX facility meeting on Monday night, my time. And in fact, this, this issue about uh, dealing with some of those challenges, vaccine, vaccine skepticism, um, vaccine refusal, and, and the notion that vaccines are in fact part of some conspiracy, uh, these things are things we have to be in, in the public health context very conscious of. I mean, what we actually want to be able to do with any vaccine that is deployed is actually have it have the maximum benefit that it can. And certainly in these cases, uh, we will get maximum benefit if, in fact, firstly, the vulnerable are immunised first and then others in the population have access to a vaccine. The less people we have who are vaccinated and the more uh, that people move around in the community, particularly if you don't reach sufficient vaccinations to create herd immunity, that will actually potentially uh, cause the continuation of the kind of economic disruption, the social disruption, and indeed the straight out political disruption that you're seeing in a number of countries right now. So the, the challenge I think is to work on how we communicate. And I'm very firmly of the view that there is no point wagging your finger and telling them they're wrong a group of people who are vaccine skeptical. And there is an emerging uh, set of science and understanding about what it does take to deal with the concerns and the issues that people have in relation to vaccines. I draw people's attention to a publication, a series of publications that have come from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And I'm now going to forget her last name, um, Dr. Heidi, and I won't be able to do that, so I knew that was going to happen, um, who is a vaccine uh, uh, expert and has been doing a lot of work on this issue. We know that if people have fears and concerns, there's not a lot of point in just telling them well, they're wrong. It's actually better, and of course the trouble with this will be that it's only going to require quite intensive one-on-one -on -one, uh, effort. But we do need to understand what is driving those concerns, and rather than just lecturing people and just telling them to comply, uh, that I think was not going to get us the right outcome. Now, I will say that uh, there are conspiracists and there are people who I suspect it doesn't matter what we say to them, they will not ever uh, change their mind. Our objective with the rollout of a vaccine will be get to get to a level of herd immunity. In other words, enough people who are protected that if there are sporadic outbreaks uh, of this disease going forward, that they do not have the devastating consequences on individuals and indeed on the society and the economy that we all are operating. So you're right, it's a huge problem. I have to say that the, the 
um, sort of connection between vaccines, 5G, Bill Gates, and some kind of weird third world, you know, third order that's trying to control everybody is, is right out there in some sort of odd um, science fiction conspiracy, which I do not profess to understand. But I'd suggest that what we need to do is tackle thoughtfully uh, and not in a way that is lecturing the concerns that people have to encourage people to take up safe and effective vaccines. Well, thank you. I've, I've got a question that came in from James Stevens Cutler, who's at the Counselor Council here in WA. He asked, is this really a once in a century pandemic or is the rate at which we experience these widespread infectious disease events going to increase in the future? Mm, thank you. And it's Heidi Larson. I knew as soon as I said this, <laughs> stop talking, I'd remember. Um, so, James, that's such a good question. Uh, there's a number of people who've been saying for quite a number of years that we were overdue for something that was global, that it was severe, and that was uh, not something we could readily respond to. I have to say, most of us thought it was going to be flu. And of course, the advantage of a flu outbreak, uh, notwithstanding that these are not necessarily positive experiences, is we know how to make a vaccine for flu. And whilst you have to identify the particular strain and you actually have to manufacture a vaccine in respect of that strain, you can do it, you can scale the technology and you can tackle that issue relatively quickly. But essentially, uh, the kinds of things that we're seeing now are a con as a consequence of uh, the level of density of human habitation of the planet the connection and the closeness between that habitation and wild animals and virus reservoirs, and then uh, the, the real risk that there will be zoonotic events and that those viruses that are the result of those will have the characteristics and attributes that mean that they are communicable between uh, human beings and that they have bad outcomes in terms of the health consequence. Probably worth remembering uh, that viruses that kill lots and lots of their hosts actually aren't very effective because they're not very good at spreading. Uh, what you see with an effective virus is it actually can infect large numbers of people and keep being transmitted. And so it is actually a concern that I have, and it's one of the reasons why I agreed to chair the CEPI board, is that we actually will probably see more of these kinds of events we will probably need to be able to respond more quickly. And that's one of the reasons why CEPI has a, a list of what we call priority pathogens that all the experts tell us are potentials for this kind of occurrence. And so being with, uh, in a position where we have candidate vaccines that have been taken up to phase two trial level, in other words, we know they work and they're pretty safe, uh, which means in the event of an emergency, you can scale up and out quickly. Uh, that is one of the reasons why I was so happy to take on this particular role. The truth is, uh, this will not be the last of these events. The truth is, the probability is that it will happen much more quickly than the 100 year gap we have had between the uh, poorly named Spanish flu and this event. Just a reminder to everybody, uh, Spanish flu isn't Spanish. It was the Spanish who were prepared to actually publish what was going on about that particular outbreak, hence its name, uh, Spanish flu. So it's for the last century, it's a once in a century. My bet is it won't be the only event for the next century. Your, your response uh, made me recall a wonderful uh, profile that was done of you in the Weekend Australian in early June, um, where they recounted an experience you had late last year uh, where the World Economic Forum, and I think with some involvement of, of CEPI, uh, yes. doing a, a scenario planning exercise, which in retrospect, I think you described as spooky. Uh, yeah. I kind of highlight that, but uh, I, I, I'll turn that into a bit of a question as well. Um, the profile that in the Australian described you as long having dwelt in the alert but not alarmed camp. I wonder if mm -hmm. that still applies today or going forward. Oh, no, beyond alarmed. <laughs> Definitely. And look, the thing about the alert but, alert but not yet alarmed, um, I, I think I've recounted, I don't know if it was in that particular article, 
Um, what happens if you if you inhabit this world is people ring you pretty regularly and say, well, there's an odd kind of outbreak of novel uh, pneumonia and sort of unexplained pneumonia cases here, there or wherever. Um, and what happens is all the people who are in, interested and involved in these, you can see them all kind of go, oh, is that it? So we actually had an outbreak of the Nipah virus in India a few years ago in, southern, in Kerala, and it was exactly the same. And in fact, interestingly, that particular outbreak, which had, we now know, uh, originated in a young postal worker who collected, we think, a bat. Um, he was very interested in wildlife, collected a bat that was injured, or, and we suspect dying, on the way home on his bicycle. He then contracted Nipah virus. No one knew what it was. Fortunately, a doctor who was very alert uh, spotted that outbreak, figured out what it was, and I think you know it was it was less than twenty people died, but that could have been a disaster. Mm. So we're all the time we are at the mercy. So every time we hear this story about unusual pneumonia deaths, you'll find everyone going, Ooh. and then, oh no, it's all fine, <laughs> or not in this case. Um, the next question comes from Ian Sains, uh, who I sit with on the board of the United States Study Center at the University of Sydney, but I think you know from many other uh, uh, boards as well. Mm. Yeah, is it your view that China is always communicating honestly about its discovery of viruses, and in particular, the coronavirus causing COVID-19? Yeah. So look, I mean, there's been a lot spoken about China, and, and I know that sometimes our relationship with China can be uh, fraught, and I don't want to involve myself in that discussion. That's is, This isn't the context that's right for that. The thing I've pointed out to people um, is that the Chinese actually released the genetic sequence for this virus very, very quickly. Um, they released it in early January. And I, I personally do not believe that in the event that they fully understood what was going on in uh, early December or indeed late November, that they would not have alerted people to that because of this significant damage, including reputational, that it does if you do not disclose. And certainly the Chinese authorities have a great deal of experience of that historically because of what happened in the SARS context. And there's a whole set of publications and books that have been published in relation to why that was not good practice. It is certainly the case um, that people around the world are discovering viruses all the time. They publish in scientific journals. And I think one of the reasons why some of the conspiracy theories about this being a manufactured virus um, have uh, gained some traction is there were publications coming out of the Wuhan Research Institute and they had been doing work on uh, bats and coronavirus. And they were well known for their expertise in this. And indeed, they were also looking at the antibodies that were uh, present in a series of populations uh, around a set of caves, some distance from Wuhan, but that, that was their research expertise and that's what they were working on. So uh, I think in common with all researchers, they publish. Um, they don't always want to tell people before they publish. So can I be completely confident that anywhere in the world uh, that everybody who discovers something is putting that in the public arena in the first instance. No, I can't, because I think there are reasons why they might withhold or wait until they've published, et cetera, et cetera. But I do think we could overplay uh, the issue about the release of data in relation to this particular virus. Um, as I said, the genetic sequencing was released in early uh, January, and that is actually what led, has led to the speed in an environment where we're in um, from going from that genetic sequencing to having vaccine candidates in 16 weeks. Given that we've got people listening live from, from around the world, including the region, I wondered if I could steer you back to kind of a regional question and kind of combine yeah. questions. We have one question from Santi Martini, who's at the University of Erlanga in Surabaya in Indonesia, yeah. who wants to know uh, uh, what your recommendations might be for Indonesia, who you described early on as and relatively early on in the phase of this. Yes. And, controlling the pandemic. And my own colleague here at the Perth US Asia Center, Kyle Springer, wondered if, given your global role, there are examples of, of early collaboration between Australia and other countries in the region that you might highlight that would kind of uh, not just set an example for, but show areas where we might work together. Yes, thank you. Um, so, so let me say, firstly, um, to, to, to Santi um, in Indonesia, uh, and I know that currently your numbers in terms of deaths are pretty low. They're about, for a country that is as populous as yours, um, you're sitting on about 5,000 known deaths. Uh, and I think we've all seen the publicity in relation to the, the real damage that's been done uh, economically, 
to people's lives uh, as trade and travel has stopped and my thoughts are with people who actually really struggle now for income and for, for ways to support their families. Essentially, as I mentioned already, the best defence we have at the moment is those NPIs, those non-pharmaceutical interventions. And the question about how you give people as much protection as you can, uh, recognising that in some communities, people do not have an option to stay at home completely isolated. They do have to um, uh, have food to feed their families. So the hygiene, the masking, uh, the distancing, all of those things, those measures that we know will reduce spread. And certainly in Australia, we're saying to people absolutely explicitly, if you have uh, a COVID-19 positive diagnosis, you must not uh, go out. You must not expose others, uh, you must stay at home and isolate. And uh, we're doing this with return travellers through basically uh, having everyone go into hotel quarantine um, and then continue to make sure that you test to know that when you're clear. So I think in common with everybody else, those basic rules, um, and if people are interested and haven't looked these things up, regardless of where you are, the WHO on its website has some really uh, good and clear and simple uh, messages about how you can achieve that, including importantly, how you wear masks safely and effectively. And the bottom line here is uh, if you wear a mask and they should, you can make them, uh, they need to be three layers thick. And if you make them, they, if they're wet, they're not effective, which means you need multiple masks during the course of the day. But if you're out and you have been breathing in and out of a mask, uh, and you then touch the front of your mask with your hands, the real possibility, if you've been near somebody and it's droplets sp spread predominantly, the real possibility is you've now taken droplets onto your hands. And if you then use your hands um, without having hygiene uh, to touch your face, uh, touch somebody else or touch surfaces, then you can transmit. That, um, that disease. So I think the challenge for everybody, um, uh, Santi, is basically actually making sure that practice of these initiatives is really meticulous. And you know what? Uh, this is not dependent on your GNI. It's not dependent on your climate. It's not dependent on all sorts of other things that might be relevant in other places. It's actually uh, dependent on the discipline that everyone applies to themselves. In terms of how though we might work with countries around the region, certainly one of the things I'm advocating is um, if and when there is access to vaccine, um, that we as Australia, um, particularly if we were lucky enough to have a successful candidate in Australia that would be produced by CSL, that we need to make sure that in terms of global uh, protection, but also regional protection for the vulnerable, that we might be party to assisting in that respect. And I've certainly passed that message on to anyone who can get to listen to me in government, you'll be pleased to know. But I think also, and importantly, um, we need to actually protect each other in relation to travel. I'm still m mindful of the very emotional experience of looking at um, a mat uh, in an exhibition in London about Polynesia. And the mat was given by the then New Zealand Prime Minister to the people of Samoa. And it was uh, as an apology so many years later for um, the actions of a New Zealand harbour master who actually let people off a boat that had come from the United States and it had on it people who had Spanish flu. And as a consequence, I think about a quarter of the population died. Um, so we can protect each other in the way we actually manage our interactions as populations, as well as assist with advice, and hopefully also be able to assist with vaccines, because those simple steps can actually help whole populations protect themselves and each other. Can I follow up on one specific element uh, of your, your comments? And obviously you described with, with, with great detail some of the risk with the mask, uh, but it seems to me that this is one area where the public discussion has become unnecessarily polarized because a lot yeah. of the discussion is, and you rightly pointed out, you know, mask alone won't work. There's some risk in the process, but it seems to me that the real debate is, is mask as a social responsibility as opposed to a defense. In yeah. other words, yeah, whether or not it's effective at, at protecting you 
it certainly is far more effective at protecting others from transmission. And isn't that the, the more persuasive you know, argument for wearing a mask as opposed to self-protection? Uh, you know, rather, you know, impeding transmission as opposed to self-protection. Well, it depends on what motivates people. I mean, the things that motivate people's behavior will vary depending on the individual. I mean, if you're principally uh, motivated by economic concerns, and we know from consumer data that people between the ages of about 15 and 44, that's their overriding concern. So appealing to them in relation to doing the right thing and not killing granny probably aren't going to be the sort of thing that will motivate their behavior. However, if you can say to people, mask wearing will actually continue to enable the economy to operate, you to be able to actually work within certain constraints and go about your business. Um, so there's a level of not just um, not transmitting the altruistic motivation that you talk about, but there's also an intrinsic self-interest in actually helping stop spread, which means that you can go about your business. And if you're currently, for all those people who are listening to us currently from Victoria, um, all I can say is uh, I, uh, I empathise, uh, I cannot do anything about your pain, but I, I just need you to know that people across, I think the world actually are very mindful of what you're going through. So, and it is important though, just Gordon, to be really clear about this. Uh, there is evidence that uh, masks prevent spread, that is true. There is also evidence that masks present you, prevent you actually getting the illness. And I can point you to the 39,000 people who've actually gone through hotel quarantine in New South Wales, um, where there have been a significant number of people with COVID-19 diagnosed in that caseload, and where not one case of hotel-inquired infection has been recorded across that entire group with the use of surgical masks and appropriate PPE. So um, I, I, think, I think we do need to have a balance here to understand now, it still relies on people wearing them effectively. It still requires uh, people to take them on and off uh, effectively. But I think we also need to think about what it is we're saying to people so it's in a way a, a message with a motivation that they can relate to. Thank you. We have a question from someone online right now. Uh, Di Wikes, I believe it's pronounced. She asks, how important is it that we have an accurate estimate of the level of infection in the community? and notes that she understands that there is a pilot program in the UK right now that's looking at home testing or home screening just to try to get a general sense of the level in the community more broadly. So, Yeah, look, so, so we do need to know what the incidence is in the community because basically, particularly um, in countries like the United Kingdom, certainly like Australia, um, I'm a bit loath to mention the United States in this context. Um, but in other countries where, where people, and in fact, Vietnam's done a fantastic job of this, let's be clear, where you're putting in place um, mandates for behaviour, uh, where you're putting in place mandates for can and cannot be done, um, actually knowing how much virus is circulating in the community uh, does help you uh, to make a decision about what mandates should be in place. It also actually helps you understand what the level of uh, pressure on your health and hospital system is going to be. I mean, many of you would be aware that uh, ventilators are necessary as part of, uh, for, sadly, for some, the acute stage of this illness. And if you don't have enough ventilators in, in terms of anticipated uh, numbers of people with the disease, and this is where we get back to the flattening the curve that I mentioned at the very outset, one of the reasons you want to flatten the curve is you do not want your health system to be overrun. You do not want enough capacity in your health system to properly treat and meet the needs of the people who present. Now, one of the things I have said in Australia is I, I don't particularly think that many Australians would be very happy um, if intensive care was having to occur in car parks and people were dying in car parks because they couldn't get access to necessary treatments. They may still die. The mortality rate, sadly, once you get on a ventilator is pretty high. Uh, but what people don't want to know is that somebody died for want of access to the right care and treatment. So you do, we do need to know all of those things. Uh, we do need to know where the risks are, what's coming, and we certainly need to understand um, more about the whole ecology of this disease. I understand that this is still a developing situation and there seems to be surprises around the, every corner, but we have a question from Jane Seymour. Oh, who asks, hello, Jane. What are the significant lessons Australia must learn for dealing with future pandemics 
given that subsequent viral outbreaks will most likely manifest themselves in a manner different to that of COVID-19? So <laughs> it's such a good question, isn't it? Because I mean, if you think about it, even though we have been anticipating a flu outbreak, um, what we're seeing here is something quite different. And what we're seeing is a different set of requirements in our health system, as we just talked about. But what, what we actually also can take, I think, from what we're learning at the moment, are a series of lessons about our resilience, about our systems, about our supply chains, about what it takes to mobilise quickly and what it takes to effectively deliver a whole series of uh, things. Let, let, let me give you an example. Uh, we all know that there was, and I'm going to use a pun deliberately here, a run on toilet paper. Mm. And we all know that for some reason, toilet paper um, and the absence of it and the need to buy vast amounts of it became a feature of the early part of this. So what does that tell us? Um, firstly, that we didn't fully understand the supply chain around toilet paper. Um, and indeed, we had to figure out who made it, how it was transported, how did it get into supermarkets, and how was it we could actually give people confidence that actually there was plenty of toilet paper, everyone should just calm down and not worry about their need to go out and buy, you know, basically pallet loads of toilet paper. But those supply chain issues um, actually are very real. We had significant worries about access of all things to Panadol. Um, we have had significant issues in relation to access to PPE. So we've learnt a series of things about how we might be able, in a kind of all hazards approach, deal with uh, future shocks of this kind and I would argue, including how much capacity we have onshore to deal with things into the future. Now, there's a long way to go before all the lessons of this crisis um, will actually be fully understood. And it is the case that Australia has um, unusually, although I have had a bit to do with this, um, we've retained some things onshore, particularly vaccine manufacturing, and some people um, know about the history to this uh, onshore. But many countries don't have any capacity to manufacture vaccine at all. So they are entirely reliant, and indeed, as will we be, if the technology isn't something we can manufacture, on these kinds of very um, uh, truncated, restricted supply chains. We also know uh, that what it takes to coordinate across agencies in this kind of context is something that we need to start learning and thinking about. What redundancy do we have in our systems and our, our capacities? Um, will we have enough fuel on shore? There's all these things that we, uh, I think, will take from this experience. Um, we've been lucky because one of the things that we were able to do was source enough, going back to what I said earlier, ventilators. We've also been able to repurpose manufacturing in respect of things like masks. But if you think about the delay, had we not been successful in suppressing early on uh, the rate of the virus, its transmission, etc., and therefore... Uh, the real stresses and pressures in our healthcare system, we could well have faced a significant, a significant and material shortage of PPE. So I think it's all those lessons that we will have to think about. And to your point, um, given things will out, man, outbreaks, other events will manifest in different manners. We actually have to do, I think, a series of scenario uh, analysis scenario uh, mapping and processes to think through what those things are to have a really broad ranging um, view of where we're vulnerable and it's interesting one of the things I had to do today uh, was give evidence to the bushfire royal commission now I did ask myself why do they want to see me but it turned out their interest was to do with the supply chain type issues and one of the things I said to them um, was that one of the things we've learned here, we've learned it in bushfires, but we're certainly learning it here, is these coordinated arrangements, which clearly successfully work when they're founded on these emergency management um, processes. No single agency has the answer, no single agency can fix it. But we actually need to engage a much broader, broader range of stakeholders. So the example that was given in the bushfire context was uh, access to cash. But you can take other things uh, as examples. 
So if you need access to cash, who do you need to do that? Well, you need to move cash, you need to have access to cash. Who should you have as part of those dialogues? What plans should you have in place? How often should you exercise those plans? And how broadly have you thought about the potential scenarios? And so I think going forward, um, it won't just be seen to be slightly paranoid people like myself who worry about these things. I think there'll be a much broader engagement with how do we make sure uh, we are as well protected as we can into the future. I appreciate your focus on, on supply chains and manufacturing and on the behind the scenes things that are going to be required. And obviously that will be a very important part of vaccine, both production and distribution going yeah. forward. I have to tell you from personal experience, we had a family wedding at the very beginning of the outbreak in Australia. And as a result, for the last five months, we've had 14 COVID refugees of our children and grandchildren living in our house. And so the, <laughs> the toilet paper debate was not academic. It was an acute crisis early on in the process. So I appreciate the referencing there. Uh, you won't be surprised to know that we've got a number of people online uh, watching from Victoria. Uh, all eyes in Australia these days are on Victoria, yes. uh, including a member of our board of directors, Deidre Wilmont, uh, and mm -hmm. former uh, Premier Ted Bellio, who's, who's both watching. Uh, let me combine their two questions together. You won't be surprised that they're interested in the Victorian response, what went wrong, mm -hmm. what we learned from that at this point. But uh, Ted has a very specific question, which I think you, from a public policy perspective, might want to address. And that is the, the, the different strategies between suppression uh, and elimination. Uh, are we still trying to flatten the curve? Uh, or in the case of Western Australia, where there's been, or New Zealand, where there's been a, a clear effort to kind of suppress it altogether. So, mm, yeah, well, firstly, uh, hello, Ted um, and Deirdre. Um, uh, as I said earlier, I'm. I'm I'm there with you in spirit. Uh, so, so the question of what went wrong in Victoria, uh, firstly, I think everyone should be a little cautious about um, kind of looking down their nose and saying, it's only the Victorians. Uh, there, but for the grace of God, I suspect in many, many cases go the other states and territories. So firstly, I, I think there should be no kind of self-congratulation in other parts of the country. Uh, secondly, there is an inquiry, and it is an inquiry being conducted by uh, Justice Coate. She, as I've pointed out to people relative to my um, hotel quarantine uh, review, um, she's doing an inquiry. She has powers to compel. She has $3 million and a, an entire phalanx of lawyers assisting her. And her job is going to be to get to the bottom of, of what specifically happened here. I mean, it certainly is alleged that there was a breakdown in the hotel quarantine system, particularly in respect of security guards. I don't want to speculate about that. I don't have the evidence that would enable me to form uh, uh, a well-founded view of what's gone wrong, but clearly something has gone wrong. In terms of um, the response that's happened since then, um, I think we've seen, and we're getting daily reports, of the challenge in contact tracing, uh, the being overwhelmed, uh, speed to get testing results, et cetera. What this reinforces is the absolute importance of keeping public health as a key focus and priority in everybody's health system. Uh, you can't create people who can effectively contact trace overnight. Uh, you cannot um, get your testing mechanisms and reporting mechanisms uh, literally turning around overnight if you don't have a well-developed system. So I think there's going to be a series of questions that they will need to ask themselves going forward about whether their design is fit for purpose. On the suppression versus elimination question, let me start with a technical answer first in relation to elimination. And elimination is a global thing. It has a whole bunch of definitions from the WHO. You know, we went for elimination of um, smallpox and we achieved it. It took years, it took a vaccine, it took um, all sorts of reporting. It's very difficult to do. The same is occurring at the moment in terms of um, malaria and you'd be aware of the, the polio work, I know. Uh, we've used language like suppression here, and the, the question is actually, can you suppress to the point that either it's completely manageable in terms of the odd outbreak, which you can effectively contact trace and keep it under control, versus uh, can you basically bring community transmission down to zero or close to zero? And we know from New Zealand uh, that you can bring uh, community transmission down to zero, that's where they are at the moment. Uh, it's come at a huge economic cost. And of course, at any time, if there's a slip in their quarantine arrangements, just as could, has we think happened here, um, you could end up with it back out in the community. 
So I, I think there's a bit of an academic debate, to be perfectly honest with you, going on here. Um, regardless of whether you have at one point in time actually uh, so completely suppressed to the point of community transmission elimination in one particular community or place. Well, ever this is running around in the world, we all have it. And we need our public health systems, we need everybody uh, who's involved in those systems to be uh, alert, alarmed, testing, monitoring, and engaged with these issues. So I think wherever it's proven that our public health systems cannot deliver the kind of testing and uh, tracing and tracking regime to keep numbers right down to a minimum. And there's a whole further discussion in how you engage um, communities in that process, uh, how it is you use people uh, with different language backgrounds, how you engage community leaders. Uh, you know, there's probably a whole bunch of uh, opinions I have that might uh, have been relevant to how they conducted this, but I don't have the knowledge. But suppression versus elimination, my view is it's a bit academic. Uh, we all, while well, it's in the world, have it, and we need to try and minimise it uh, in our communities to the best of our ability. Thanks. We're almost out of time, but let me just squeeze in one final question here. Um, uh, Rick Stern from UWA uh, Convocation raised the question of hydroxychloroquine, which is a strange yep. thing many people around the world can pronounce that. I, I might frame that in, in a little bit of a different way in that in the last you know two weeks, my social media feed uh, coming out, not just the United States, but Australia has been flooded by a highly partisan debate on hydroxychloroquine. And so I, I wonder if you might address just that debate around a specific drug, but then how that plays into a public policy response when there are partisan views about individual treatments as opposed to kind of evidence or database views. Yeah, so hydroxychloroquine, um, as we know, has been well promoted by a certain alleged leader of the free world. Um, and essentially, the evidence for it, uh, I don't do research. I don't do research in this space. I have no particular knowledge other than what I read in the research. And what I remind everybody of is there have been a number of trials that have been undertaken. In a couple of cases, they have been stopped um, because either the evidence was that it didn't work uh, or it, it actually potentially caused harm. So whether you believe one or the other of those versions, certainly the fact trials have been undertaken and stopped. And this is particularly in respect of people who have um, very severe disease. And there are studies that are quoted, uh, for example, where it's alleged that it, it has been a benefit. But if you look at the design of those studies, there's one in particular that I think is quite well known. Um, it's completely confounded because the people where it's alleged there was a benefit from the use of uh, it, they were all administered steroids. And steroids are widely acknowledged to actually potentially assist, particularly if you've got uh, significant lung issues. So the research at the moment does not support its use. Um, we do not know really in relation to any prophylactic benefit. People are clearly doing work on that. There's ethical issues to do uh, with the conducting of that. Uh, and same issues that we have in relation to vaccine trials about whether you believe in challenge studies or not. Um, certainly, uh, what I would say is based on everything I read and the official advice on this, which I think we should always be minded to, not what people who either have a commercial interest or some other interest in uh, promoting it, is, is the official advice that it has particular benefit, is it not, and take that advice. And in this particular case, it doesn't seem to have particular benefit. Well, look, we could go on for a long time. Uh, and the the advantage of an hour long conversation like this rather than a kind of one page meme is you can get a lot more detail, a lot more nuance, but obviously we could do a lot more than that still. I referred early on to a wonderful article that was done in the Weekend Australian on the 6th of June. Uh, and I, I think uh, it's, it's worth all looking. If you just Google Jane Halton West, uh, Weekend Australia, you'll find it. I think it, the title was Cool in the Crisis, Jane Halton Leads the Search for, uh, for a COVID-19 Vaccine. Um, but at the end of that article, their conclusion was quite interesting. It, they, they mentioned that in your previous roles in government and internationally, you were largely behind the scenes, making things work. Uh, mm. But they made a conscious decision to raise your mm. profile because mm. you felt that it was your duty to help people understand issues around vaccines at a time like this. Exactly. Uh, for that, on a personal level and on an institutional level, we at the Perth USA Asia Center, and on behalf of our audience, we thank you for your time. We thank you for your insights. Uh, and we look forward to future conversations and we wish you every progress when you work at CEPI.
Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. My very best to all who've been participating today. Thank you. Thank you.